I'm photographer David Dushman, and this is Vision is Better, a sometimes weekly podcast about the craft and art of photography. Welcome here. Hey, welcome to another episode of Vision is Better. This is a special episode, the last of four that I'm calling After the Camera Live-ish, in support of a resource I created in January 2016 called after the camera. And this was, uh, is a resource about what I call a vision driven workflow and uh, the creative process uh, in Adobe Lightroom. So I've got a photograph here of these Japanese macaques, macaques, Japanese snow monkeys, they're Japanese snow monkeys. And I'm going to answer a couple of questions that have come my way in order to wrap this up. But first, I want to say thank you to everyone that uh, played along, submitted photographs. I apologize that I haven't used all of the photographs. Uh, uh, thank you to those who submitted them and, and you know whose photographs I used. But the ones that I didn't, mostly I didn't use them uh, because I, either they were too similar to other photographs or I just couldn't come up with anything meaningful to contribute that I thought was better than what I had covered already in the videos of After the Camera. And so anyway, that's <laughs> that's my thank you and my apology. Uh, I had a couple of questions. The, the first question had to do with the adjustment brush and the dodging and burning. And the question was, how do you make it look natural? How do you make sure that you don't go over the top on this stuff? Um, the question came from Alvin who said, one of my worries is that the adjusted lighting will look unnatural and just really easy to make this kind of stuff look unnatural. I could take the adjustment brush and uh, for example, uh, I could brush in on this little guy over here and uh, you know, want to really brighten him up and go too far with you know a whole bunch of things and contrast and uh, and and you could in the end make it look um, quite unnatural, especially since you know there there are laws to these sort of things. The way light behaves, if you want to lighten him, you should probably also lighten the reflection a little bit. If you want to lighten this guy, you should also lighten his reflection a little bit like that. Sometimes we do the eyes and we go a little bit too much and we go overboard. So here's and and here's an extreme. If I go over here, here's the uh, the options for my brush and I put no feather whatsoever. I'm going to delete what I've done in terms of brushes. I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to give you an, an extreme on this uh, and that's you know just painting painting on this guy like this. Right, I'm, I have no feather whatsoever. Uh, if I press zero, that'll give you this. I'm going to even. I'm going to crank up the uh, the flow on this, and really go kind of kind of whole hog here. Um, if you if you looked really closely at this, you would notice the edges just drop off immediately. And if I went, you know, let's say I'm going to brighten this up. I'm going to get rid of the mask so you don't have to look at it. Um, it's very possible that you could, there's a good example of doing it poorly, um, you've got no feather here and light doesn't work like that. Very rarely does light work like that. Most of the time light kind of fall, falls in in a in a broader kind of, it is, I mean we talk about light as being feathered. So if, if the question is how do you avoid it feeling heavy handed, uh, here's my answer. Lots of feather, low flow, and I mean, the size, of course, depends on, on what you're doing. Uh, and then make your adjustments if you're doing, for example, exposure. Don't just crank it down. It's, it would be really weird to have a scene where, um, you know, these monkeys in the background and the ambient lighting didn't at least in some way match the lighting that is striking these monkeys, unless, of course, you've got some kind of uh, strobe situation going on. So, how would I treat this? Well, I probably would give it a little bit more, um, and I'll hit it O to activate that, uh, the mask, so I can see what I'm painting. I'm going to have the light fall on him as well. So again, quite a heavy feather. I'm going to allow the light because the light that hits this little guy is the same light that's going to reflect in the pool. So I would do uh, both the reflection and the monkey himself. Let's go a nice big brush like this 
and, f and keep it nice and feathered. And then I would, making sure I watch what I'm doing, that's why I take the mask off, I would bump him up a little bit. I would not go too far because if I go too far, it's going to be a very strange transition. Here, let's take this much further. Uh, very strange transition to go from something so bright here to, to something darker over here. Why are they not let in the same kind of way? So I would go much subtler. I would dial it back to maybe adding a stop. And then if I needed to, lighten uh, maybe the rest of this scene, except obviously for these highlights in the background, I might lighten that uh, with a different mask and, and bump that up by, say, uh, you know, half a stop and kind of meet in the middle if what you felt was you needed to bring some um, some lightness overall, or I might go to the gradient tool and I might drag a gradient, you know, something like this and lighten everything. So everything on top of the changes I've made here. So these have been uh, lightened, say, by 100%, but everything else over here has sort of been in a graduated kind of way lit up to 50%. I would just adjust that, uh, you know, a little bit like 25 or 30 to 35 or something like that. Um, so that's in answer to the question, how do you make it look subtle? You, you use your subtle tools. You pull back on some of your, your more dramatic changes, use heavy feathering, use less flow. And you, I would go back to the photograph maybe the next day and just see if you haven't been a little more heavy, heavy handed than you needed to be at the time. Um, I'm going to go on to the second question from Alvin. He said uh, one of his biggest challenges is with color and getting it uh, getting it somewhere close to accuracy. Now, Alvin acknowledges that I don't really go for accuracy in color, but you know that's that's within a certain uh, parameter. A certain I mean, let's face it. I, I'm not going to just settle on any color for this photograph. It still has to be believable. So generally speaking, uh, I photograph always in auto white balance, always in raw, and I will bring my image into Lightroom and uh, cool it or warm it as needed. But sometimes the tint is a little bit problematic. You can have a little bit too much magenta or a little bit too much green. And so what I will do is I will use this stopper and I will pick what I would consider to be a target neutral. What's difficult about this is you're telling Lightroom make this value and therefore everything else accordingly make this one neutral well snow we all know to be white but the problem is it's rarely white it's often shades of uh, of blue especially if it's in shadow it can be quite blue if it's in a um, sunset or sunrise context uh, it could be quite warm and so you, you don't actually uh, you can't just say snow is white so uh, it, nor could you say for example that the stones in the water here are uh, meant to be neutral. For one, you could actually go here where there's a monkey paw under here and you might accidentally click on that and no, that's not meant to be neutral. It's actually meant to be sort of uh, a little bit warmer and, and kind of brownie color. So you've got to, the answer Alvin is uh, trial and error. So I will pick a neutral and I will look at it and go, oh, okay, did that do what I want to uh, to the fur? Did it do what I want to skin tones or, you know, the, the red here? Is the snow believable? Does it give me the look of the photograph without uh, losing, at one, without losing the... Um, the sense of reality and does it maximize the mood? So for example, I, I, that brings it to what I would consider probably pretty neutral. If I click on the snow, it is a little bit warmer still, but I felt that the scene was cooler and so I would get it to a close, something that felt right and then tweak it from there. So I'm gonna just cool it down a little bit that to me is much closer to how I felt about the scene than um, than a different preset. You could also try just scrolling through these and go, okay, what does the auto do? What does what does cloudy do? This was a cloudy day. Does it does it warm it up too much? Sometimes cloudy can be quite warm. Shady definitely would be too much. Uh, how does auto look? And I will just go through them and ask myself, how do they look? And then I will tweak them accordingly. That to my eye is much more how the scene felt. The third question that I got, and uh, I hope the person that asked me this will forgive me, but I don't <laughs> remember who asked me, but the question was, what makes a great black and white conversion? And 
without oversimplifying this, I would say that a great black and white photograph is, generally speaking, is uh, characterized by its tonal contrast and uh, placing those contrasts where you want them. And there are three really great tools for uh, creating a good, solid, uh, and desirable tonal contrast in Lightroom. So I'm going to go to... Um, uh, so here's the tools. Uh, one is clarity. And of course, this, so let's start with the black and white image. As soon as I click on this, it's it's not a very contrasty image. In fact, this is kind of muddy and kind of gross. All right, let's go back up here. First is clarity. Clarity gives you mid-tone contrast. And I find in many, not all, uh, many of my photographs that are black and white, a bump in clarity more than what I would do in color is appropriate. Again, not always, but that's one of the tools that you're working with with contrast. Yes, you could use this contrast here. It's a different contrast slider, but I would rather do um, a tone curve. So tone curve, medium contrast, or potentially strong contrast will give you a, um, will introduce more contrast to the image and therefore better uh, tonal contrast. And you could go to your black and white mix. This is the one that I love playing with. So for example, if I felt I really wanted to you know, darken or lighten a face, well, I know that their faces are very red, or I could use the tonal, um, excuse me, the target adjustment tool and go here and pull up and down and find where exactly that sits. All right, now you can also use your dodging and your burning in uh, in a black and white photograph and increase the tonal contrast in areas that you want to. For example, if having made all these changes, if this is what I want to do with the photograph, I might go to my radial filter and I might create uh, a little bit more light around the eyes. And again, I would keep the feather fairly high as a default. Mine's at 50. And then uh, again, coming back to being subtle or not, this is far too, uh, this lacks subtlety. So I would push the exposure a little bit, probably not even that much. I'd probably go back later and tweak it. And then uh, maybe the blacks want to want to move up, maybe not. But the shadows certainly would give me a little bit more in uh, in that area. And then if necessary, keep those keep those adjustments quite. Uh, quite broad because again the, the light that's hitting one part of the face is hitting all of the face and, and the more subtle you are about it I think the stronger the effect uh, of the photograph so in answer to the question and I think if I were doing this photograph I would probably uh, let's close out of that I would probably bump the clarity even more and I might use an adjustment brush and push in some clarity uh, just clarity with the adjustment brush because I love the clarity's slider's ability to pull out things in terms of texture, like these water drops. So I might just push the clarity a little, at least to see what it does and see whether that helps me pull out a little bit more of, uh, of those water drops and a little bit of sharpening could do it as well. But if the question is what makes a great black and white photograph, make sure your blacks are black, make sure your whites are white. Uh, this, this was misunderstood by, by a student of mine at one point and, and he understood it to mean make sure in every photograph that there are pure blacks and pure whites. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is make sure that anything that is meant to be white, make sure that it's, it's pretty, pretty white. Uh, anything that's meant to be black, make sure it's pretty black. It doesn't have to be pure white. It shouldn't probably be spiking off the side of the histogram. The black should not be, you know, all bunched up over here, probably, or off the side. But um, other than that, make sure your whites are white, make sure your blacks are black. And then remember that uh, dodging and burning, that drawing the eye with that sort of that push and pull can be uh, particularly helpful in something like a, a black and white image. In the case of this photograph, that would have been lightening up the face a little bit, that adjustment brush coming in here and giving a little bit more uh, clarity and sharpening to the to the water droplets and it might be something else and this has really nothing to do with specifically with the black and white uh, but lowering you know the amount of uh, like that white that was way up at the top of the frame there was a lot of that and so if I crop and bring it in a little bit that gives me a much uh, more focused image. I could also, for example, use a radial tool and in the reverse, I could darken 
everything in the scene just like this. And you could either use exposure or you could just, in the case of the whites, you could just pull it down a little bit. Um, that's the that's effectively creating a subtle vignette and pulling the attention in. Um, again, uh, going back to Alvin's question about about not being heavy-handed, the key here is subtlety, and uh, you can very often tell if you go to the before and after view. You can very often tell whether you've been a little bit too heavy-handed. And again, I would probably sit on the photograph and see what it looks like later. You can, uh, I take my images, uh, and I've shown you this before, you can take your images into the print module and see what they look like against, uh, you know, like a, a fine art mat, uh, but the white will help you get a sense for how muddy this is. Immediately I look at this and go, yeah, it's, you know, I've been staring at this too long. Uh, it's it's a little bit dark. So I would just go back into the de develop module. Yeah, you know, it definitely looks a little bit too dark. What would I do to correct that? I would probably, uh, I would see if taking off the, sorry, it wasn't lens correction at all. It was a radial filter. Um, see if redoing that radial filter a little bit uh, doesn't sort of make me feel a little bit better about the image or even just bumping the, the exposure on the full photograph. Um, see if that does it. something like that so i would consider that you know a good starting point for for me being done and then i of course i would print so if there was if there was anything that i could leave you with in this series it would be that you approach things with some subtlety that you play with all of these tools as though they were creative tools not necessarily as technical tools and that you don't approach them as there being one right way to do it and a wrong way to do it of course some of these things are going to affect the image in ways that you find undesirable and for that image it, it would be wrong but i think you would be losing out if you did not give yourself the chance to try all of these tools and see what effect that they make in the image and then lastly i would encourage you print your work when you're finished working on this stuff and you think you're getting a little bit closer to the treatment that you want i would print your work and live with it for a little bit don't just move sliders around hit print and then go i'm done i think uh, our work evolves too much for that i think we as artists evolve too much for that and our use of these tools should also evolve in in step with those changes so thanks very much for those of you that joined me if you uh, have enjoyed this uh, and you want to find more uh, about the vision driven workflow and the kind of uh, the way that I use Lightroom in my creative work, I would suggest that you take a look at After the Camera, which is a 20 episode video resource about the vision-driven workflow, and you can find that on craftandvision.com. Mm -hmm.